morning. So I'm going to present um, a load of micromorphology data from several castles across Europe. So some non-dark earth medieval <laughs> micromorphology. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of um, several other micromorphologists as well, including the excavators. So the um, idea of this presentation is to use the um, below ground buried archaeology um, to look at what that can inform you about the sort of early use of castles and how the um, restoration work um, of these castle sites can affect the buried archaeology. So this is just an outline of the talk. Um, I'll start by introducing the castles and um, the archaeology. Um, and then I'll sort of introduce some of the geoarchaeology results and look at how we look, um, identify the threats to the buried archaeology on these sites. So there's a bit of context. Um, successive waves of conquest and colonisation during the Middle Ages have shaped present-day European society. Um, and as a result, castles are an important, iconic sort of statement of these waves of conquest and colonization. And often when it comes to um, the protection of these monuments, the above ground archeology span is very much favored um, instead of what's below. So the idea of this paper is to review the state of the archeological remains at these sites, um, various sites in different countries across Europe, so Estonia, France, Latvia, Poland, Italy, Spain, and the Netherlands. <coughs> so just to show you where all the sites are, and a bit of context. So I'm presenting um, data from two of the sites, uh, one in Poland, one in um, Estonia. So um, Elblon Castle in Poland, here. Um, which sort of sits into the context of the um, Northern Crusades, the Prussian Crusade, and um, Karksy Castle in Estonia, um, within the context of the Livonian Crusade. We have a castle from, a Motten Bailey castle from Kessel in the Netherlands, and two from France, uh, Chateau de Cayenne and uh, Chateau de Gienne. Uh, Cayenne is in Normandy, <coughs> and uh, Gien is in the Loire Valley. <coughs> and we have two castles from Italy, um, one in Lombardy, um, Castle Seprio, and one in Veneto, um, Monte Grotto. Uh, both these sites had underlying Roman occupation um, and then subsequent Gothic um, castle. And uh, we have a site um, in a different sort of environmental setting, say more of a, a semi-arid environment, in Molina de Aragon in central Spain. So, as you can see here, um, these, this is um, Elblon Castle in Poland and Kessel. So Elblon Castle has no above-ground archaeology. All the um, fantastically preserved timbers here and stratigraphy are all sort of below ground, um, below the demolition rubble, so they're buried by that. Um, the reason this was excavated was part of a sort of a head of development excavation when a new castle was built by the museum. And this work was done as part of the uh, Ecology of Crusading project at the University of Reading. And um, the museum itself didn't actually get funds to publish the excavation monograph. <laughs> so all, the only sort of material that will be published from this will be the scientific work that was done. Um, Kessel Castle in the Netherlands. Uh, the work was carried out, the um, excavation and sampling was carried out um, as a result of conservation work, um, which allowed um, a shaft 
well, an elevator shaft was going to be put through the mott, which enabled um, <coughs> samples to be taken from the very bottom layers of that. And this was carried out by the municipality of Kessel. And the same sort of situation for the two French castles as well. Again, refurbishment and restoration and conservation work that was being carried out al allowed the samples to be taken. So um, at KN, this very much looked at sort of reuse of the castle site, um, whereas at GN, we're looking at the sort of early occupation. <coughs> And Carpsey Castle, again, has no sort of standing remains anymore. This was destroyed during the war, like a lot of um, castles in no northern Europe. Um, but this sort of demolition at the top that you can see here has effectively sealed the um, lower deposits. So you can see, again, we have fantastic organic preservation um, in this semi-waterlogged environment. And just to show where the two Italian castles are, Castle Seprio and Montegrotto. Um, this again was a research excavation and looking at the reuse sort of squatting activities um, later on in the history of the castle. Uh, Molina de Aragon in Spain um, was carried out as a research excavation, but looking um, firstly at some exposed profiles um, these profiles here and here had been exposed by um, previous uh, architectural studies of the castle. So um, <laughs> more of an architectural survey that had just sort of exposed the sections, um, which is it's not particularly great for the preservation of the stratigraphy in this area. Um, I've got thin sections from this and you can see um, the ashes and all the plaster is very badly preserved as a result of these interventions. Um, whereas the sort of later um, excavation that we did, we did some geophysical survey this year, um, last year, and this year we sort of um, looked at the remains of a building that had been buried by the collapse of a tower and had absolutely fantastic preservation. So. Um, just to sort of highlight how the uh, um, <coughs> interventions and leaving exposed sections isn't great for the archaeology. So um, the sites at Kessel, Carxi and Gien really highlight um, the early occupation, the early sort of colonising first phases of use at these sites. So you can see um, this is the, through the outer bailey of the castle. Um, these sort of organic lenses, which you can't really sort of see <laughs> um, what they are <laughs> just by looking at the profile. But these, so the colours correspond with the slides around the edge. So you can just see um, the fantastic um, different types of organic deposits that we have. So they're packed full of sort of stabling waste, um, seeds, parasite eggs, um, articulated phytoliths within the dung um, and nicely sort of preserved seeds as well. And the same sort of situation at Carxi where the um, archaeology has been buried by these sort of huge stones from the collapse of the castle. And again, a fantastic sequence of occupation. Um, starting with the creation of a pond. So we have pond sediment at the bottom that gradually gets infilled by the sort of remains of trampled leaf fodder and then this amazing midden <laughs> overlying this so you can really document the changing use of space. Um, we actually have fragments of millet <coughs> as well embedded within the herbivore coprolites. Um, and at Kessel we have this, um, this isn't a waterlogged sequence, but it's been preserved in a very good state by rapid burial. So you can see the finely laminated sediments here. So I think very much sim sort of similar to a scenario that you get in an urban environment with this rapid sort of burial. Um, 
and we can see here we have like well lo loads and loads of lenses of phytoliths from the use of mats um, as well as the organics um, being replaced by these um, iron pseudomorphs. And this is a similar situation um, in the early use of the castle at Gien. We also have um, these sort of layers of phytoliths which have been attributed to the use of mats as well, reed matting. Um, and again, this is a non waterlogged site, but a fantastic um, sequence of stratigraphy has been preserved. <coughs> so, um, all these sort of examples have really sort of highlighted um, the sort of activities within the early castle. Um, so, you can see here we have um, bits of hazelnut preserved, bone, um, eggshell. So, this is in the midden. Um, again, sort of burnt eggshell at Gien, fish bones. Um, so, it's just packed full of packed full of stuff, really. And um, as well as sort of showing about the refuse disposal, telling you about the animal husbandry practices of the early colonizers. So how people brought their materials, what they brought with them when they first colonized the site, and how they managed um, their livestock. So I mentioned the millet that we have embedded within the coprolites. Um, this is particularly important <coughs> for this area, as um, the written sources don't suggest, um, suggest that millet wasn't um, available or recorded until the 16th century. Um, but here we have it sort of being used as animal fodder. Um, at Elblong as well, we have um, grain sort of being used um, in the very first sort of occupation within the castle. Um, and we have uh, sort of sheep and goat um, uh, coprolites in the earliest deposits. And then you see a change in um, the use of the space for the animals that were kept there with much more sort of um, longer strands of dung with um, parasite eggs embedded within it. Um, probably from bigger herbivores like um, horses. So we also have um, crop processing residues, so looking at how food um, resources <coughs> were managed and the waste that was disposed, and particularly important for um, Carxy Castle within the um, deposits in the pond, the infilling of the pond, we have fish gills in thin section, which look quite cool, like these um, sort of little combs. Um, so this is particularly important because castles are effectively fortified monasteries, or the Teutonic Order castles are. So it's telling you a bit about how important fish was um, for the earliest people who arrived in that area. Um, so they're sort of managing the fish resources on the site. And um, Cayenne, Castle Separio, Monte Grotto. These sort of give an idea of the activities um, at the end use of the castle as well, as well as the building materials that were used. So earthen building materials um, and calcareous plasters. But again, a fantastically well-preserved, non-waterlogged um, sequence within the castle as a result of rapid burial. So I think everyone here knows the, what micromorphology um, can tell you. So it's particularly good for understanding the formation processes and um, what these examples have shown us um, are looking at processes such as bioturbation and the redoxymorphic pedo features, decalcification, um, clay translocation, and the formation of iron sulfides. So you can see the effects of these processes on the preservation um, of the stratigraphy. So we have insect burrows, um, quite sort of, I hope you can see, quite clear at Molina, 
um, the differential preservation of ash materials at the different sites. Um, so at Castle Seprio, we have ashes preserved, whereas at Monte Grotto, um, the ashes aren't preserved. At Elblong, the um, earlier deposits were continuously inundated by marine waters, which has led to the formation of iron sulphides. And we can also see things like the iron replacing the organics. So this is something you obviously don't see in the field. You wouldn't know that these were particularly organic deposits. It's what you see in, in section. So all the examples um, that we've looked at have sort of been rapidly buried, either by collapse or later building activity which has led to um, exceptional preservation at these sites here. So at Elblom and Carxy we have partial water logging of the sequence, whereas at Gien and Kessel there is no water logging. Um, and at Molina de Aragon, from our recent excavation this summer, once we got rid of all the huge boulders that were <laughs> burying the um, building below, there was absolutely fantastic preservation of desiccated plant remains, so of wood, um, ashes that looked like they had been sort of thrown out yesterday, um, as well as fish scales within there as well. So this is a sort of semi-arid environment, but the fantastic preservation has led to these ashes here. And this is um, the sample that was taken. <coughs> So just to think about some of the um, human threats to this buried archaeology, um, obviously the archaeology is preserved by the burial, um, and as micromorphology has highlighted, it has really shown sort of really sort of good information about the earliest use of these buildings and the subsequent later use of these buildings. Whereas restoration activities thank you, are going to remove um, this material and so uncover the material which is providing a threat to its preservation to these fantastically well-preserved organic deposits and ash deposits. Um, excavation itself as we saw at Molina which has exposed these profiles um, has led to very bad preservation of the ashes and plasters, <coughs> which in other areas of the site are exceptionally well preserved. And I also have um, the use of <laughs> castles as hotels as a threat as well, <laughs> um, because they do make very nice hotels and people do want to stay in them. <laughs> and um, um, the micromorphology has really sort of highlighted just how good this buried archaeology is and um, how it sort of should be. I think micromorphology really has a role to play in how this is looked after and how sort of the management of these castle sites is thought about. Thank you.